What do you do when your faith system no longer fits? Because sometimes you outgrow it. Sometimes you graduate, you ascend, you leave the old, itchy, worn out way and you begin to walk in the new. Sometimes you grow. Join the conversation with me, Tony Werfel, author, speaker, teaching pastor, as we help unwrap and rebuild a faith that no longer fits. We learn to walk into the new, messy journey called life. Hello, everyone. Welcome to podcast number eight of Faith Undone, where we, uh, we're learning to see faith a little differently. We're redefining it. We're learning to deconstruct and reconstruct a system that doesn't demonize history, philosophy, the arts and the sciences, but actually learns to embrace them, finding new and bigger meaning in the story told. So last week, we discussed Alexander Shia and his four-part journey into wholeness through the Israelite journey. So we discussed it, how it means to what it means to find your yourself in captivity, you know, these storms in life and how to kind of navigate through them in a new sense of being and awareness. And so once you begin calling out you begin getting the sense that things could be better, that's when the journey takes on movement and change. It's when your journey actually begins to get legs. And so for the Israelites, the narrative suggests that they're freed from bondage. And after they're freed from slavery in Egypt, the story continues that they actually begin to wander the desert. And get this, they wander for 40 years. Now, (laughs) if you're like me, this strikes you a little bit odd, right? 40 years? First off, let me share with you something you may not appreciate here. And actually, let me just give you a caution. If you are a literalist and uh, you need the Bible to be very literal, you may want to just skip over this podcast in general today. So I'm going to give you a moment. You can hit the pause button and and just wait for next week. All right. (laughs) I warned you. So here we go. Let's go back to this idea of captivity for a moment before we even get into the 40 years. Historically speaking, there are some inconsistencies. So we often imagine that these Hebrew slaves, they're building the pyramids for Ramses and they're being whipped and treated poorly by the evil Egyptians, right? Because that's what we were told in like the Prince of Egypt, the movie and and all these other things. Um, We begin looking at this empire kind of like as the evil force that caused the good Israelites to suffer, right? And, and again, we kind of align ourselves with like Charl, uh, Charlton Heston, head of the NRA, as he, he commands that Pharaoh let his people go. But let me throw a wrench into the story for just a moment. I found this out. In 1977, Israel's prime minister visited Egypt's National Museum in Cairo. And what happened there I find really fascinating. He stated, we built the pyramids. And here's the thing, to the surprise of both the Jews and the Christians, this actually sparked outrage there in Egypt for the Egyptian people. Because get this, they were proud that they had built the pyramids. See, the belief that Jews built the pyramids may be prominent for like Christians and Jewish tradition, but that's not the way anyone in Egypt remembers things. How we remember things is kind of important. And and, and what of history? So let's consider the pyramids for a moment. Most of Israel's large pyramids, they were built around like a, a 900 year period. And, and historians will, will often try to say it's around 2650 BC to maybe 1750 BC. And, and we also know quite a lot about the labor force that built the pyramids. And the best estimates I've seen so far are that 10,000 men spent 30 years building the Great Pyramid. And get this. Again, so interesting when you begin to dig into the history. They lived, these workers, they actually lived in really good housing at the foot of the pyramid. They've excavated this stuff. They've seen it. And and when they died, these people actually received honored burials in stone tombs near the pyramids in thanks for their contribution. And watch this, there's even more. They ate well and received the best medical care. And lastly, here's the thing. They were paid well. So virtually every fact about the workers that archaeology has shown us rules out the use of slave labor on the pyramids. Interesting, right? So when historians have looked for real evidence for the Hebrews living during the times of these pyramids, they've actually found little to none. 
Israel itself didn't actually even exist until about a 1100 BC when, when various Semitic tribes are, are joined in Canaan to form this, this kingdom, at least 600 years after the completion of the last of Egypt's large pyramids. Anyone like, whoa, wait a second. And so with that being said, it's also important to note that there is no literal exodus of an enormous group of people leaving recorded anywhere. No documentary or archaeological evidence links any of the pharaohs um, bearing the name Ramses with plagues or Jewish slaves or edicts to kill babies. In fact, the earliest, Ramses I, he wasn't even born until more than a thousand years, a thousand years after the Great Pyramids were completed. And his grandson, Ramses II, he lived even later than that. So now, now let's talk about the travel. So consider the wandering. They are in the desert. They've been freed, the story goes, from Egypt. And now they wander. And, and the idea here is they tell us it's been 40 years, 40 years to go from Egypt to Canaan. Now, the actual time it would take to get from Egypt to Canaan during this ancient time with ancient travel, now listen close, it would have taken them about 11 days on foot nonetheless. So one archaeologist says the distance was actually so short that if you added up the men and the women and the children, which would make around a million according to the narrative, they would actually fill the distance between Egypt and Canaan by standing in line, <laughs> right? Now, I've heard some people try to argue that, well, it's because they were too stubborn. They had the wrong mindset, Tony. That, that's why they, they ran in circles. But I've got to be honest with you. I think that a people who took even over a year to travel an 11-day journey would not be fit to share wisdom about how to guide my life if they themselves aren't even able to get to Canaan in less than a month. Now, I'm pretty bad with directions, but I feel like after the first couple of years, <laughs> I'd have to stop and maybe reconsider some things. Maybe this walking in circle thing may not be the most helpful to get me to my destination. 40 years? Seriously? I feel like even Hollywood's Charlton Heston could have maybe gotten this right. 40 years. So, what do we do? Do we throw the story out? What do we do with this? Here's my take on it. The Israelites, again, are not writing actual, literal history. They're writing their larger journey as a people. They add metaphor. They add a lot of epic elements to it. The probability is probably given the traditions that there maybe were some Israelites who left Egypt post-pyramid era and maybe joined up with their people in Canaan, which would seem like a likely scenario, which would maybe make the Exodus a very small scale event with a large world changing trail of consequences. But it's not exactly how it's written because it was not written as history. So again, please understand they're not writing literal history accurate history. They are sharing something far larger in scale. They're sharing a life journey that I think we can all relate to. So here we go. The story they told during Babylonian captivity of what happens after a people or an individual leaves a place in which they feel like they've been a slave. After they do this, they have to begin walking in a new direction. They leave the old behind and they start stumbling forward. So can anyone relate to this? Anyone ever take that step, that big step away from something that was destructive? You left the job, you took the fishbowl, said, who's coming with me? You walked out of the office and now you're like, oh man, what have I done? <laughs> like, what was I thinking? Uh, you, you broke up with that person Maybe you ended the relationship, relationship and, and after a couple days of sitting on your couch watching The Notebook or something and, and maybe cradling of Ben and Jerry's, maybe you're wondering now, did I make the right decision? Was the relationship really that bad? Maybe, maybe it wasn't so bad. Maybe someone is there right now and you're asking, what do I do? I'm free, but I have nowhere to go. I have no real direction. I don't know what I'm doing. 
I don't know what's next. Walking into the new direction isn't always easy, is it? So for the Hebrews, it was less about leaving actual Egypt and more about getting what Egypt stood for out of them. Let me say that one more time. For the Hebrews, it was less about leaving an actual Egypt and more about getting Egypt out of them. So for us, leaving the old way, old cycles of brokenness, it means we learn to unlearn a lot of things. Let me ask this then. What do you need to unlearn right now? So you ended up in that bad relationship again. And finally, after months of terrible arguments, sleepless nights, you're free. So here's my question to you. What did you learn about yourself? What did you learn? Why is it you keep going back to those kinds of partners? What is it about them that causes you to be attracted to those people in the first place? Here's another one. Could the issue be less about them and more about you? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but but ask the question. What about your understanding of your own self-worth keeps bringing you into that kind of relationship? I think once those answers arise, the scary part is actually learning to walk in the new reality, the new awareness. After you've had to answer some of those questions, of course, the next thing is, how do I walk in it now? What do I do? And so this is what the Hebrews called desert wandering. So in their story, the desert, it's not easy traveling. It's actually a bunch of stories of these people falling back into these vicious cycles. They keep moving back into idolatry, back into wars and violence, back into Egypt slavery. And so it's just basically, it's a roller coaster of ups and downs. Because here's the reality. We learn from the desert wandering. Once you start walking, don't be surprised if you fall if you have missteps, stumbles, or or the occasional repeats, or even the, the frustrating realization that you just did that thing again. Here's the, here's the reality. It's going to happen because sometimes it takes 40 years, even though our minds are, are telling us it's just a couple more steps. It's only 11 days. Sometimes it takes 40 years. I've got a friend. She's tough. She's this independent, strong woman, but she has this past and it's a really difficult one. She comes from this long line of drug users. Name the drug. Her family has probably spent time there. So her mother left home when she was way too young to remember, which meant dad now took on the dual role of both parents and he struggled. I think he struggled like many of us would. And he ended up finding solace in alcohol and, and that, of course, came with, with other terrible consequences on her and her brother. And she tells of these nights when dad would come home just trashed out of his mind, looking to take out his rage on one of them, or worse, do other disgusting things to her. And so she told me her brother would run to her room. He would tell her, lock your door. And then he would walk downstairs and he would receive the beating that dad had. He would put himself in front of her and take on the beating of dad. He would take these beatings, sometimes so bad he couldn't go to school the next day. For for someone might, might send child services and he and his sister would never see each other again. He took dad's rage for years until he was old enough to leave the house. And by this time, the entire family was using something to numb the pain. And so brother was now introduced to drugs of all shapes and sizes, of course, with a promise of relief. And and she followed in dad's footsteps and found alcohol. And so her story is pretty sad, pretty horrific. And she's been through just so much more than I even care to share. But here's the thing. When she was low enough, she, she was put in AA after a pretty scary drunk driving accident that probably should have landed her in jail. And there she started to reevaluate her life. And she told me it was not easy. Life didn't turn around when she walked through the doors and into conversations of, you know, my name is, and I'm an alcoholic. It didn't turn around right away 
because new life is found in the stumbles. The phone calls to our sponsor and, and, and the tiny successes, which, which were followed by these really bitter disappointments. But she gave me this advice, and I think it's so powerful. She, she gave me this advice after being sober for eight years. She said, I had to learn to show myself grace. I had to learn to celebrate the small successes and understand it's a long journey into wholeness. I think that's it. It's a long journey, 40 miles through the desert. It's learning new habits that'll help mold you into a person that makes better decisions. It's, it's unlearning vicious lies you've told yourself, unlearning certain cycles you've found yourself in. It's doing a lot of learning and unlearning. Getting Egypt out of you takes time. And my hope for you during your times of wandering is that you might learn to show yourself grace too. Remind yourself it's a journey of a thousand tiny falls, a thousand minute decisions and victories that will eventually lead you into new life, into Canaan. And when you fall, because you're going to, don't beat yourself up. Choose to show yourself some grace. And by the way, stop comparing yourself to others. It's not their journey. They have their own issues, their own mess. And if you dug deep enough, you'd find their life isn't perfect either. This desert wandering is, is one we're all on from time to time. And so focus on your life because you're uniquely you. And after the desert wandering, you'll have a story to share and a new life to offer the world. I hope that during the time of wandering, you'll show yourself some grace. Blessings this week. And I hope you'll join me next week for what comes after the wandering. See you then. Bye. I wanted to try something new with some of you. And, uh, some of you have asked, hey, I, I don't know how to, how to pray, how to meditate. I feel like because, because I've begun to see God and the world a little differently, prayer has become a bit problematic. So I wanted to try to lead you through a short prayer, or uh, some people call this a meditation, that would be similar to how these ancient people prayed. Because they didn't say prayers of, dear God, dear Jesus, give me this and this and this. That's not how they pray. That's not how they meditated. Meditation was something far different. So, so let me introduce you to a different kind, a different way of uh, being grounded, a different way of, uh, of, of experiencing wholeness, of praying, of meditation. So let's try this. What I want you to do right now is just close your eyes. Just close your eyes. And first off, let's remind ourselves to breathe. <laughs> When's the last time you breathed deeply? Take a minute, just a second. Breathe through your nostrils. Now hold it for a second. Okay, now breathe out through your mouth. Let's try it again. Breathe in through your nostrils. Hold it. And just breathe out. <laughs> when is the last time you focused on your breathing? Again, just take your time breathing right now. Close your eyes, focus on your breathing. Just breathe slow. Now, I wanna do just, just do something real simple this time around. I want you to let your shoulders just kind of fall down, sag. Allow the weight of gravity to let them comfortably relax. Keep breathing slow. Now, I want you to consider the thing you've been stressing about lately. That thing is, it's taken so much time and energy. So much has been wasted on that thing, hasn't it? Take your fists, ball them up really tightly, as tight as you can. I want you to imagine you're holding that thing, that problem, that issue in your hand. Squeeze it with all of your might right now. Squeeze, squeeze. Now relax. 
Keep your fists together, but, but don't squeeze. Just relax. Now do it again. Ball them up tightly. Imagine you're holding that thing, that problem in your hand. Squeeze it tight. Squeeze the anger, the anxiety, the fear. Hold it tight. Now, allow the weight of it just to pull your hands down toward your waist. That thing that you're holding on to so tight right now, keep your hands, just squeeze them. That thing is draining you. It's killing you. And you weren't meant to carry that. You don't have to. You don't have to carry that thing anymore. Keep squeezing. Now listen to this. As you breathe out this time, I want you to turn your wrists down toward the floor. And now open your palms. Imagine the weight is falling from your hands. Imagine you're beginning to feel free, weightless. Now, place your palms up and listen to these wisdom words. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. What do you see there? Give careful thought to the paths of your feet. Be steadfast in all your ways. The thing no longer has weight, does it? It no longer needs to be carried. So now as your eyes are closed, I want you to imagine yourself walking on this narrow beam. It seems narrow, but take a couple steps forward and what you'll notice is when you look down, the beam is widening. Take a couple more steps. It continues to increasingly get wider and wider. Keep walking. Imagine yourself walking. And as you take every step forward, the beam gets wider and wider and wider. You're running now. You're running and the path now is wide open. The possibilities are endless. Take a moment, stop, look around the horizon. The possibilities are endless. You are free. Now, take a moment, focus on that breath again. Breathe in through your nostrils. Hold it. And breathe out. I want you to open your eyes. Today is a new day, and it's filled with new opportunity. And you don't have to carry that burden along that wide path before you. You don't have to carry it anymore. My prayer for you is that today you would have such an incredible day. The possibilities are endless. Walk in them now. <laughs>